So, good morning. And uh, with a uh, lot of our colleagues and our own president and the secretary of IAP, I bring greetings to this place. I am delighted to be at Manjiri. Thank you for calling me and madam. And uh, we will have a discussion on cardiac arrhythmias in pediatric practice, the best approach to diagnosis and uh, the right solution to the management. Uh, arrhythmias can have a two phase, like one of our Batman movies. You can have a slow arrhythmia or a fast arrhythmia, and this of which can be either regular or irregular. And if you have a slow arrhythmia, you call it as a brady arrhythmia, about which we'll discussion only on an atrioventricular block. And we have, of course, the major share would be, and more dangerous and more threatening or frightening would be what we call as a tachyarrhythmia. And uh, that would be starting from a sinus tachycardia, sinus arrhythmia, but most often supraventricular tachycardia, and of course, less commonly, it will flutter fibrillation, which is very rare in uh, pediatric practice, and of course, ventricular tachycardia. And we know the major, I will concentrate mainly on the uh, uh, tachyarrhythmias, where you have palpitation, you can have syncope, chest pain, sudden cardiac death, even dyspnea on exertion due to heart failure, shock, or even hydrops fetalis if you have a fetal tachycardia. So I would like to present to you this uh, arrhythmias uh, like one of those uh, plays in Shakespeare where we have seven acts. So you'll have seven uh, uh, case presentations with of course solutions for arrhythmia substrate. And uh, how to unlock an arrhythmia in an ER or an OPD or in an ICU would be to take a history, physical examination, take an ECG, a full ECG with a to lead with a long lead, at least long, long lead to have to be taken either 2 or V1. And if there is an old ECG, it will be very useful to have a diagnosis. And very importantly, take a toll lead ECG with a rhythm strip, not a simple rhythm strip, or at least sometimes if it's an emergency, at least document a, a, a rhythm strip. And of course, the added evaluation methods are not pertaining to pediatric practice. I think they are basically done by the subspecialists. So the first act. We have an infant with a six-month-old baby who came to OPD with a history of fussiness, irritability, and poor feeding. There is a gross tachycardia with mild tachypnea and no murmur. And ECG reveals a, a tachycardia with a rate of 220 per minute. So the recognition of an SVT in an infant would be basically as fussiness, irritability, frank heart failure, not very commonly shock and sometimes the pediatricians pick up an unusually fast rate on a routine examination, sometimes even for babies coming for an immunization, and you have a very fast, regular tachycardia like this. So next thing is that you need to know what is, the, what is an SVT. The common platform for an SVT it should be regular tachycardia, usually more than 200 per minute, anything go up to 300. Should have a narrow QRS tachycardia, or an, either an abnormal or an absent P wave. And there must be some STT changes, at least in 50% of these cases. And about the rate, it again varies with the age group. For example, you have a newborn baby, it can go up to 300. If you have an infant, between 220 to 80. And in an older child, you can even go down below 200, even though we speak of SVT with a rate of above 200, can be as low as 180 per minute, but never less than 160 per minute. Now, the problems in recognition and the differential diagnosis of an SVT is to decide whether it's an SVT or a sinus tachycardia, one. Another, if there is an SVT, what type, which sometimes may be useful in acute management. And if an SVT is a stable or compromised SVT, where you have to choose the modality of the management, and of course, is there an underlying cardiovascular disease. Now, sinus tachycardia is very important. You have to identify a PQRST relationship. Rate usually is less than 200, usually is less than 180. It's very difficult for a baby to de de I mean, deliver a rate of 220 and all, and varies with time, activity, and respiration. And we have a normal P wave. That is very, very important. So the symptom-wise, that there is a, some difference. For example, uh, uh, the onset will be sudden in both, but termination will be rather slow in grand sinus tachycardia, and uh, we will have a respiratory variation in sinus tachycardia if you look at very carefully. Heart rate, of course, will be long, um, bigger the heart rate or the faster the heart rate, 
more likely to be an supraventricular tachycardia. An abnormal P wave or an absent P wave would of course indicate a supraventricular tachycardia. And if you have an ischemic change, which is likely to be a supraventricular tachycardia. This is actually a tachycardia with a rate very high, but still it has a PQRST relationship. So this is presumed to be a, a, a sinus tachycardia. Now, among the SVTs, the most common in pediatric practice would be AV re-entrant tachycardia, which is due to a bypass tract, like a WPW syndrome. The second common would be AV nodal problem, and the least likely in pediatrics would be an ectopic atrial tachycardia arising from the atrium. And uh, there are, of course, differences between AVRT, AVNRT, and ectopic. The major difference we should know is that both AVRT and AVNRT responds very favorably to adenosine, whereas ectopic atrial tachycardia does not usually respond to adenosine. Now, we'll just try to see whether can we, as a pediatrician, can we recognize AVRT, AVNRT, or ectopic tachycardia, which is not that uh, a big issue. For example, if you have a, a, a tachycardia without any P wave and a narrow QRS tachycardia without a P wave, that is AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Now, the second thing, you can see again a narrow QRS, hardly any P wave, there is some slurring at the end of the QRS complex, that also could be AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. This is the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, there is no visible P wave. Now, the second is probably the most common which we encounter at any age in pediatric practice would be AV re-entrant tachycardia where you can find a P wave after the QRS complex which is inverted in 2, 3 AVF because you are looking at P wave in 2, 3 and AVF. If you find an inverted P wave after the QRS, it is most likely to be AV re-entrant tachycardia like this which at the lower strip you will see every QRS is followed by a negative sharp wave which is actually the uh, uh, the P wave. Now we have a ectopic atrial tachycardia which can occur where the P wave will come in front. So first you have no P wave, second you have a P wave after QRS and here you have a P wave in front of the QRS but it is abnormal, it is little deformed or inverted or uh, biphasic. That is would be ectopic atrial tachycardia. You can find here there is a P wave looking, so it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between this and a sinus tachycardia, but this is a very regular tachycardia with an abnormal P wave, so it has to be a, an ectopic atrial tachycardia. Now, the, what we should do is, you should break this SVT. Stay, you divide them, you know, this is standard logic, you have, look at the hemodynamic status, stable, unstable, unstable, definitely no point in waiting, you deceive it with a semi-elective or a semi-urgent procedure under conscious sedation. Whereas if it is a stable, you have some time to load and during that loading you can apply vagal maneuvers and then standard therapy would be IV adenosine followed by various other drugs if that does not respond. And vagal maneuvers, perhaps the only vagal maneuver which could be applied in infancy would be an ice bag application. And in an older child, you can possibly induce a Valsalva maneuver and never ever do eyeball compression and carotid massage. Carotid massage can be used in adults and adolescents, but not in children. Very, very important. Now, adenosine administration, I think it's some, some sort of an art which has to be learned by the postgraduates at least because we are exempted from this because you tell your uh, youngster to do this. You have anticubital vein as proximal as possible. You have to have a cannula with a three-way tap, two people, uh, no withdrawing blood into the syringe because that blood will destroy the adenosine. A rapid saline chase. And this is very important. 5 ml for infant, 10 ml for a child, and 20 ml because that should cover the distance between the anticubital vein and to the right atrium. So if you don't have enough sufficient flush, it will not work properly. And this is, of course, the very familiar site. You start with 100 microgram. Don't waste by starting with 50. You start with 100, go on to 200, and then even go to 250 to 300. So minimize the use of this. And monitor scope and keep ready a defibrillator, a IV aminophilin for a possible bronchospasm, IV atropine, and, of course, oxygen in an ICU. This is uh, uh, not, I think, this is too... Uh, basic, but basically, it's sometimes it's very difficult to calculate, and I've just given you an example of that. So, and success in adenosine is very high, 
somewhere are between 90 to 95 percent. Very, very successful, this thing. The failure to respond to adenosine is usually due to a slow push and not enough saline flush. That is a very simple practical thing. And of course, the SVT may not be responsive to uh, 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 the adenosine like in ectopic atrial tachycardia or maybe because of a heightened sympathetic stimulation in a young child. I think you can even give some sedation and then try adenosine again because you will reduce the sympathetic stimulation. The second choice in majority of the hospitals in India and in Kerala would be a IV amiodarone. You can start with the bolus and continue with an infusion. I think actually I have given a, a paper containing all the doses of all antiarrhythmic use in our ICU to the organizers and they will be distributing it because I will not dwell on too much time on this. Time is of the essence. And be careful about amiodarone is hypertension, bradycardia, and AV block. You can also choose uh, Esmolor. So first choice for an AVRT, AVNRT would be adenosine, and the second choice would be, of course, IV amiodarone and IV flicanide, but it's unfortunately not available. It's a very good drug. And this is, a, this is more important than the other. That is, it is absolutely contraindicated in the newborn, below two years, heart failure, and a wide QRS tachycardia. This is very important because IV verapamil can kill a newborn. And uh, ectopic heart tachycardia, difficult to treat, first choice will be IV amiodarone, can be flicanide or IV beta blocker. In our hospital, and our major hospital which brought me into this particular situation is SAT hospital, we have amiodarone and beta blocker to act on this. Then you can have a child with an SVT, an eight-year-old child with palpitation. Fortunately, she could get a, an ECG done from a nearby lab by the parent, and you have a tachycardia of 220 per minute. And again, a recognition of a, a SVT in a child by, is by palpitation, heart failure, rarely syncope, and usually fast heart rate picked up by either the child or the parents. And the management would be basically for a stable SVT, try vagal maneuver, but depend on IV adenosine and repeat if necessary. But sometimes you need a DC version that is in shock or hypotension, in cardiac decompensation, severe heart failure, and non-responding to the standard measures you give, give a DC version 0.5 to 1 joule per kg. Now the second act would be basically of a neonate who comes with features of heart failure, poor perfusion, hepatomegaly, tachycardia with a rate of 300 per minute. So the recognition clinically would be as heart failure, one of the very important neonatal cause of shock, which is not PGE I1 dependent, is SVT, and of course the neonate with the tachycardia. This is a very fast rate, hardly any P wave. If you look very carefully, you will find a red inverted P wave after the QR. So it's an AVRT leading to heart failure. And uh, you plan a DC version, try once an adenosine, and then if it is not successful, don't wait and go for a DC version. So neonatal SVT, the standard therapy would be IV adenosine or IV amiodarone, flicanide if uh, available, and of course DC version, and no vagal maneuvers, very, very important, and of course no IV verapamil. So there are some no's in SVT. Sometimes it is very important to know the no's than the yes. For example, verapamil one year, vagal maneuver in the newborn, combination of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker, digoxin as a single agent in controlling, not in prevention, controlling, and digoxin and calcium inhibitor in WPW syndrome. And uh, this is the data showing that SVT can kill. You can have a, a data from US saying that people, baby can be killed by that, so because it's a genuine emergency. Now, post SVT conversion, take an ECG, Look for a sinus rhythm and if there is a WPW syndrome. And post-SVT, the strategy would be either an expectant strategy like in first febrile fit by neurologist, that is you don't start. Majority of the pediatric cardiologists, including me, will start, have a traditional approach, you know, typical middle class safe uh, approach where you start with a, a, a drug. So if you have a WPW syndrome, sinus rhythm, either give beta blocker, mainly beta blocker, and if you have no W, you can safely give any of the three drugs which is present in this thing. And this is very important slide because you should know the natural history of uh, AVRT. 30 to 50 percent resolved by one year in the very young. Older the baby with the first presentation, the less likelihood of uh, a disappearance of this uh, SVT. And of course, you can have a home care. Uh, adequate suppression has to be then combination may be needed. And sometimes I think uh, Dr. Shobha, I don't know whether Shobha is here. She has a very interesting philosophy of giving, buying a pulse oximeter and giving to the parents so you can 
uh, check the heart rate if suspicious. So you can even teach a, a, a mother to auscultate and uh, 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 look at the SVT or very fast rate, which you, she cannot count. And generally what we do is you give one year from the last episode, taper slowly and look for a breakthrough supraventricular tachycardia. You know, we will have a, a, a quicker uh, uh, run through the rest of the acts. That is a fetal SVT, primary gravida, confirmed SVT by uh, echocardio echocardiography, both Doppler and M mode. And if it is near term, very easy to certify and above uh, induced labor and treat first. Postnatal management of SVT is easier than uh, uh, prenatal. And then you have to have a transplacental pharmacological termination of SVT. And the usual drugs, then popularity would be digoxin, flaconide a combination, and rarely sotalol. And uh, the major review in 2017 showed that flaconide is superior to digoxin. And uh, nowadays, we uh, give flaconide oral, which is available. But digoxin is a very good drug. takes around three to five days. And uh, the dose, I think, has been given in the material. And still, but still, all over the world, digoxin is a little more popular than flaconide. Maybe a little later, the, the change will, the transition will come. Now we have a, a child with a ventricular tachycardia, which is a broad QRS tachycardia with a rate of less than 200. And uh, this is a wide QRS tachycardia where uh, you have, this is a typical wide QRS. Nobody doubts that this is a, a ventricular tachycardia. Majority, 90% of broad QRS tachycardia in pediatric practice will be a, a ventricular tachycardia, which has to be managed. And half of them will have an abnormal heart also. So if it is a stable, try amiodarone, lidocaine, unstable, go for a cardioversion. And again, we have given the dose in the uh, text material. But most often, you may need a, a DC version. And defibrillator can be nowadays. It's a biphasic uh, defibrillator. So it's very important because you don't give the large dose. You give only 0.5 to maximum of 1.5 joules per kg. Sedation, I think most of the electrophysiologists in cardiology feel that sedation is very important because it reduces the sympathetic tone. And try to document, even if it is very sick, a little bit of bit, bit piece of tachycardia so you make a diagnosis in the later time. Now we have, a, a, sometimes you have a child with broad QRS tachycardia. We feel it is mostly a VT, but it may not be a VT. This ha we had a child who had a post-operative tetralogy of fallow who came with a broad QRS tachycardia. And uh, 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 there are many possibilities which will not go into this. But uh, sometimes you should know that SVT can become very broad. And there are some differences between VT and SVT, which I think is beyond the scope of our discussion, mainly because of the time management issue. And we tried IV adenosine, failed, because we thought it could be a, a wide QRS due to SVT. Later on, imidoron worked, and it was converted. And then the child had a wide heart, wide QRS, which means that there was a pre-existing wide QRS complex on which there is an SVT. So it was a broad QRS uh, SVT with pre-existing right bundle branch block. Then baby with complete heart block is another one, especially the newborn baby, and uh, uh, most likely possibility of a profound bradycardia in a newborn would be a, 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 a complete heart block, which of course could be recognized as independent and regular atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, AV dissociation, and an escape rhythm, which will vary. And you can treat by giving sympathomimetics, but ultimately most of this would require a permanent pacemaker. And sometimes you need an IV isoprenaline also. So fetal H CHV is also very, very important. You can try sympathomimetics to the mother, and we can even give fluorinated steroid, which will pass the trust placenta. But I think uh, uh, this is usually done around 24 to 26 weeks. Now, the last act is a baby who was admitted in our ward with uh, a, a, a cardiomegaly, heart failure, and we thought of a, a viral myocarditis or a dilated cardiomyopathy. But that was before we took an ECG, and ECG showed a, a narrow QRS tachycardia. So this is basically a, a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, which used to be called as a tachycardiomyopathy. And it takes around 24 to 48 hours to develop heart failure in an SVT. So if you have a persistent SVT, you will this and will be mistaken as a DCM. And of course, you know, all of you know that it's a curable within inverted commas cardiomyopathy and has to be treated. And we treated this with amiodarone and finally responded to oral flaconide and uh, 
and the ejection fraction is normal at the end of six months. And of course, the final act in 10 seconds is can we achieve a cure for arrhythmia? Yes, we can, especially if you treat the substrate like uh, including uh, uh, long QTS, WPW, VTS, you can have a radio frequency ablation and it's the best choice for uh, 30 seconds. Yes. And uh, you have excellent results with the radio frequency ablation. And epilogue is basically we have tried to demystify arrhythmias in kids, hopefully. Uh, case based recognition and differentiation and management and uh, cure concept of uh, and practice is also stressed. So, all should be well and ends well. And now, thank you very much. And thank you, Yoshi, Nagumar, Jos, and uh, Team Pedicon. May the peace and the force be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor, for sharing your rich knowledge on cardiac arrhythmias. Now, over to this the chairperson.